Uh, well, good morning. It is, um, it is Easter morning, and I'm excited for a few different reasons. Um, number one, Easter morning for me has always traditionally been this time where um, it's almost like a second Christmas, right? You wake up, and, and maybe for some of us, we wake up, and there's an there's a Easter basket uh, waiting for us. And I wish I was joking, but for the past few years, um, my mom doesn't actually do an Easter basket anymore. Now it's just like a big bag of candy, and I love it. And, and she's gotten to know like our favorites, and so like those Starburst Fave Red Jelly Beans, those are like thebomb.com, so good. I absolutely love them. And so we get these little goodie bags of, of candy, right, on Easter morning. And we celebrate. And I remember as a kid waking up and you had these baskets and, and you'd go and Easter, Easter egg hunts and, and you'd get all dressed up and you'd look the very best you could have in Sunday and you'd eat and then you'd go and you'd get all the eggs that you could. And you're only supposed to get a certain amount, right? That's how it was in my family. You're only allowed to get, you know, 10 eggs per kid. But somehow I think I always ended up with like 12 or 15. And I don't know why, I, maybe I just couldn't count that well, or maybe I just, you know, took a few extra. Um, but I remember Easter being a celebration. And I remember always, maybe not even when I was younger, understanding the biggest celebration of all that was happening. But I think now I, I fully get it, and I think I'm starting to understand it even at a deeper level every single day. It's the day that everything changed. Think about it hundreds, thousands of years ago, everything changed. The day where Jesus redefined so much in life. This is the day, the moment where Jesus walks out of the tomb and as he did that, the word impossible was removed from the dictionary. The word impossible was no longer in existence for him and in his presence. All bets are off. Everything is possible now. It's Today that we celebrate, the day that he changed everything. It's a day now that we celebrate that we don't have to operate under a fear of death. We don't have to operate under a fear of what is to come, but rather an excitement in joining with him in glory. I mean, think about it. The impossible was done. The impossible was done. Jesus died, and then he was buried, and then he rose again, and then he gives us his spirit to this day. Impossible. But we have to understand also that in these moments, there's a reality for those back then, but even for us today, that we are haunted with maybe. If we're honest, we can reflect back that when he rose again and he even appeared to his disciples, there's still some doubt. There's still some curiosity and frustration, maybe. And maybe even unbelief in those moments. And if we're honest, we know that even today in our world, in our country here, even there's, there's struggles with unbelief. There's struggles with doubt of who Jesus truly is. Maybe you know some people who struggle with who Jesus really is. Let's just be honest, maybe for you yourself, you still struggle with who Jesus really is. And that's why today I want to talk about maybe where you are in the crowd of Easter. I want to talk about maybe where you are. I mean, you can imagine this last week for Jesus. Go on and try to just picture it. Go on and try to to be back just a week ago, the triumphal entry. The moment where Jesus rode in and palm branches and cloaks were laid down. Hosanna in the highest, glory to God. Jesus is here, our Messiah, our, our Savior. Fast forward a few you know, days and you get Jesus teaching, cursing the fig trees. You get him celebrating the, the Last Supper. In the moments in that dinner that took place that were so profound and pivotal, you get the conversation about the betrayal. You get maybe that glance with Judas. 
You get the conversation with Peter about the denial. You get the tension of Jesus removing his cloak and washing the feet of the disciples. You get Jesus breaking the bread and pouring the wine and offering it as a symbol of his body and his blood poured out for us. You get the foreshadowing and the prophetic words he would speak about it. And then they move to the garden and the prayer in the garden. (laughs) And you can picture Judas maybe walking into that garden and seeing Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, and walking up to him and kissing him on the cheek and the arrest. You can hear the soldiers as they're mocking him and spitting on him, beating him, You can almost feel the abuse and the pain that he was going through in those moments, and yet, yet it wasn't even close to being over. You get him before Pilate and the crowd. You maybe can see Jesus exchange a glance with Barabbas. (laughs) Barabbas, in those moments, had no idea what was about to happen. Barabbas, his life would change forever that day. And he didn't even get it. Pilate and his words that he would speak (laughs) leads him to the cross. This torture device that the Romans had perfected, they had become so absolutely good at torturing and killing people on the cross. They were well known for it. The cross, it was reserved for some of the most horrible crimes and horrible criminals. You can picture the nails that pierced his wrists and his hand, er, er, in his feet. You can feel the crown of thorns around his head and the blood dripping down and the sign that's nailed above him and the guards tearing apart his clothes and you can see Jesus hanging, being mocked, ridiculed, and he's hanging there and left to die. And they take him down, and they put him in a borrowed tomb. (laughs) It's not even his rightful personal property. They put him in Joseph's tomb. They, They borrowed this tomb, and And the chief priests, and and they think they've won. The devil himself thinks he has conquered Jesus. He thinks he has finally triumphed over God. But what's so funny to me is in these moments, God, I just picture the Father sitting there, and he just simply starts to do something slowly. And he just simply starts to go, one, Two, three, and everything changed. On the count of three, everything changed. He rose. Jesus rose from the dead. Do we understand the victory in that? He did what nobody has done before. He died and rose again, all on and dependent upon the power of God within him. He conquered death itself and then he appears then he appears to his closest followers he goes and he shows them he he demonstrates his hands and his side and his feet he says look at me i am here i am jesus the once crucified savior i am here in the flesh among you i appeared and i'm not going to stay hidden no longer i'm not going to be tucked away in a grave no longer no 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 i have come back and i will change everything moving forward today he changes everything but yet yet some still don't understand or they refuse to believe it 
And I think that's so often where we can find our world and maybe even ourselves. I think that when we look at the crowd of Easter, I think it kind of breaks down into four crowds. The first one, crowd number one. What's in it for me? (laughs) What is in it for me? If you read in the scriptures in Mark 15, this is what it says, verses 11 uh, through 15. This is what it reads. At this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. And Pilate asked them, so what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. But why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed talking about Jesus? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to Roman soldiers to be crucified. Talks about Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate looks out to the crowd, and he says, so who should I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus? Here's what's so interesting to me is that I think for this crowd, what's in it for me is it comes down to this idea of I know enough about Jesus to want him on my side, but not really do anything about it. Think about it. Pilate offers a choice. We're going to go over here, Barabbas. Pilate offers the choice of Barabbas or Jesus. Barabbas, more or less a known terrorist in those times, nor or less a known criminal, a, a brutal, brutal man. This man has no reason to be let go in those times. He's done horrible, hateful things. He's one of the worst of the worst, essentially. And he was a threat. He was a threat to the people. That's why he was in prison. But Jesus, over here, what has Jesus done? Jesus has just come and spoken truth that he is the Messiah that he is God's son, that he is God. And that's the two people that Pilate offers the choice for. Barabbas, who was unruly, uncontrollable, and an even evil man, but yet, yet the Pharisees and the leaders, the religious leaders, choose to crucify Jesus. Why? Why? For them at the time, they were being led by their leaders and the leaders were seeking what was in it for them. The Pharisees were seeking what was in it for them. And then ultimately, they were conveying that message to the people. For for the Pharisees, what was in it for them meant they get rid of this distraction to what they were teaching. They get rid of Jesus and what he was doing and it became easier for them. So Jesus dying allows them not to worry anymore about him and his teachings. Therefore, it's an easier life available to them. And therefore, they're going to tell the masses, crucify him. Because if he makes my life easier, he's going to make your life easier. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? In today's world, I think that so often we're told that you can find love, happiness, joy, and all these other things in the things of the world. You don't need Jesus. You can find it wherever you want and that becomes your God. For some people that means money becomes their God because that brings happiness, joy, and everything that goes with it. For for other people it might mean a, a certain relationship, an unhealthy relationship, but that brings them love, joy, and happiness. So that becomes their God. That relationship, that person maybe becomes their God. Essentially our world asks like what does Jesus give you? And maybe for ourselves, we need to ask ourselves that question of what does Jesus give you? Remember, Jesus promises us trials, struggles, and tribulation. Yes, he promises those. But he and only he offers us true peace, hope, and true freedom, and true love in and through him. I I was listening to um, a speaker, and, and she was speaking about love. And and I found it so profound what she was saying. And she said this, she said, some of us are looking for a deep love in life, but we often forget that if we look for God 
and we find him, we get love. Because that's who God is. God is love. He and only he is true love that is selfless, good, and beautiful. So if we're looking for something in this life, maybe, maybe, just maybe, if we look to God, we're going to start to see and understand and feel what we are looking for in the truest, purest, most holiest sense of the way. But there's another crowd. There's another crowd. Crowd number two, and they say this, I'm smarter than God. Crowd number two says, I'm smarter than God. Uh, This, Mark 12, this one's not, um, I don't have a slide for it, but this is what it says, the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them. This is right after Jesus tells a parable of the evil farmers. And the, the Pharisees realize that Jesus is telling this story, this parable about them. And that they, the Pharisees, are the wicked farmers. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. I'm smarter than God essentially comes down to this statement or this thought. I know enough about God to make my own Jesus. I know enough about God to make my own Jesus. Just like the religious leaders of those days, we've been told over and over and over that we don't need religion and we don't need Jesus. We've been told over and over again that we don't need religion, we don't need Jesus. That you can find all these things that Jesus offers in the world. Ultimately, you say you don't need him. Mark 14, this is what it says. Jesus was silent. He made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, just those first two words. Just, just hold up. Think about that. I am. This I am is this moment where Jesus literally looks at the high priest and says, I am. He uses the holiest of holy names for God himself. This is the name that Moses would have been given back in, in the Old Testament. This is the name that the Jews clung to. They believed that this name was so holy that when they were writing it in the scribes and they would write it down on paper that they believed that they would literally have to put down the pen and they would go and rinse themselves and then come back and write it with a brand new pen with new ink, just his name because it is that holy and that revered. I am. He uses a name that, that name, that name nothing can touch. That name has all the power in the world. This is the same name that when Jesus is arrested in the garden, the guards ask him if you are the Messiah, if you are Jesus. He says it, and it says that the guards fall back at just that name. I am. When you have all the power, you don't need all the words. Just in that name alone, there's power in the name of Jesus. He continues on, and you'll see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then you can imagine the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried out. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit on him and blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. I'm blown away that they thought in those moments as Jesus spoke of who he truly was, they knew knew more than Jesus. Those high priests thought that they knew more than Jesus. And I often wonder how often we could operate in the same way. How many times has God showed us what he is doing, but yet we think we have it under control and we just ignore it? How many times have we seen what God is doing in our lives and yet we just overlook it? They thought they knew more And they knew best compared to Jesus. Are we doing the same? 
If you take a step back, you can understand that the charges were bogus, the mocking was belittling, the beating was barbaric, the cross was brutal, but, but the sacrifice was beautiful. And to think that he went through all of that just so that we could belong with him and in his presence. <laughs> he went through and held and took on bogus charges. He took on words that were, were belittling to him and, and so painful. He took on beatings that nobody deserves and he bore a cross that was, that was heavy, uncomfortable, painful, all so that we could just belong with him. And that leads me to this next crowd, crowd number three. Great story. I'll see you next year. Now, <laughs> um, essentially what this crowd comes down to is the thought of, well, I know enough about Jesus to celebrate the holiday. Now, uh, <laughs> I know that there might be some of us watching today, if we're just going to be honest, that um, I get the privilege of seeing you maybe twice a year. And this might be the crowd that some of us have maybe fallen into. Ah, it's a great story. I know enough about Jesus that I should celebrate this. Mark 11 uh, 9 through 11, this is what it reads. Jesus was in the center of the procession. The people all around him were shouting, Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. What's so interesting is in that text, it's the text of the people gathering and they're praising Jesus because they, they've heard enough about him to know that they should praise this man. That Jesus is who he says he is, but they're going to celebrate him in the moment. But a lot of these people are going to be the same people that in, in a few short days go from saying, praise him in the highest of heavens to crucify him in the most brutal of brutal ways. They're going to be this crowd that knows enough about Jesus to celebrate him, but not worship and live for him. Now, I know for some of us, we're sitting here like, and, and we might be saying like, yo, Kyle, you're making me uncomfortable. Maybe I'm speaking to your heart, and I, I'm, I'm excited about that, to be honest with you. Maybe for some of us, we're just like those people proclaiming the praises and blessings of God, but they've not truly known or believed what they were actually saying. They say the words, praise him in the highest of heavens. Praise God in the kingdom of David. Let his kingdom come. But they're the same people. They're the same people who are saying crucify because in that day, in that moment, it was the right thing to do. Triumphal entry. Praise him in the highest heaven. I'm going to lay down my cloak in the palm branches. It's the right thing to do. Everybody's doing it. But then in a few short days, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because this is where everybody is. Does it sound familiar maybe for a few of us? I mean, I, I, I can admit that I remember growing up and some of my friends and some of my extended family members, some of my extended family, they'd go to church twice. Christmas, Easter. They celebrated Jesus on Christmas and Easter. And that was it. They became content with celebrating what is right or appropriate. But when things are good or when it's just a normal week or when it's not a holy holiday, we're just going to leave Jesus where he's at. We're just not going to touch him. We're not going to bother them. We're not going to talk with them. Things are going good. Well, why should I talk with them? Things are fine. We're good. We're all right. Why should I bother them? Or when things are really bad, Jesus is making this happen to me, so I'm not going to talk with them. You see, 
they became content. We've become content maybe as a world in our country and maybe even us personally with just celebrating and talking to Jesus two days a year. But this is dangerous. This is dangerous. And here's why, because Jesus is still and will still work beyond these days and these moments. We don't, at least for me, I, I don't want to leave Jesus in a manger. I don't want to leave Jesus even in Mary's arms. And I really don't want to leave him even in Joseph's care when we just talk about him. I, I want to live and breathe and preach that there is a living, breathing, resurrected Christ and he is here and he is present and he is real and he is working and he's doing incredible things and he is victorious and he is soon returning. And I don't know about you, church, but that is a great place for a virtual amen right there, that Jesus is living, he's breathing, he's real, and he's doing incredible things in this world amidst everything that is happening right now. And he's victorious. He's victorious. He's victorious. I don't want to leave him in the manger. And I don't want to leave him in Joseph's arms and care. I don't even want to leave him on the cross or even in the tomb. I want Jesus and I want to preach a Jesus that is living, breathing, and active today. Because that's what I believe. I believe that there's truly a difference in knowing who Jesus is and knowing Jesus. A lot of us can know who Jesus is. But there's a difference between just knowing him and, and truly knowing and living and following him. And, and that leads us to our last crowd. Crowd four. I'll follow and I'll do whatever God wants me to. Mark 16. This is what it says. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. And she went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. <clears throat> but when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Afterward, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but again, no one believed them. Still, later he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. And he rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And then he told them, Go in two all of the world. Preach the good news to everyone. And anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. This crowd, it comes down to the idea of I know enough about Jesus to give my life to him. I know enough about Jesus to give my life to him. And I think for some of us, our hesitation is is we, we know and we've heard about the resurrected life and, and the, the resurrection of life that comes with Jesus, but yet, in order to be resurrected, you have to die first. We want to be filled, but we don't want to be emptied of ourselves. We want to be clothed, but we don't want to be stripped away from everything. Here's the reality, and hear me on this. Jesus was severe. He didn't mess around. He wasn't joking. He said, leave all, not just some things. Don't leave the things that you are comfortable with leaving. Leave all things and follow me. He said, leave everything and follow me. You must die to yourself to experience true life. And for some of us, we sit here and we hear these words and we're like, man, like, Jesus is a severe man. Like, those are hard. Like, that's really hard. Does he, does he, does Jesus, God, understand what he's asking us to do? Let me just ask that question one more time, but a little slower. Does he, God, understand what he, God, is asking us, man, to do? The answer is, I think, yes. Because if you go back and read through the story of Christ, Let's also not forget this. Don't forget that whatever he asked others to do, he did himself. 
Jesus never asked anyone to do something that he himself was not willing to do and did do. So what's holding you back? What's holding us back from living as we are commanded and commissioned to go and live as? What's holding us back? What in, in our lives are holding us back that we are not Y'all, I'm just going to do one thing real quick. This is not normal for us, but this is what we're going to do. Lord, I just pray right now that I know that you are up to something. In these moments, I know you are up to something. And God, I know that as you are moving and stirring, Lord, we know that, that the devil himself is trying his hardest to prevent what you are doing. And so God, in the name of Jesus right now, we pray that the devil flees. I pray right now, Lord, that the devil flees. His evil forces flee from this place right now, Lord. And may your kingdom come, may your glory be done, and your words be spoken right now in the name of Jesus. I don't know where my mic cut out, but um, the interesting reality is this. Death, death, hear me on this. Death used to be an executioner. It used to be this, this moment where death came, and that was it. People died, and nothing happened again. But now, but now, because Jesus has come and because of the resurrection, death is no longer the executioner. Death is now the gardener. Hear me on this. Death is now a gardener. It's not an executioner. Because when you bury a Christian, you don't, you don't bury them. You actually plant them. Our bodies don't become this rotting, decaying corpses, but rather germinating seed for the whole world to see that what God has made new, nothing can take away. And, and the journey to the grave is one way to his glory in his heaven. We no longer, we no longer just die and nothing happens. When you are made new in Jesus, when you die, you sit at his feet in the best, glorious party you've ever been at. And so here's our challenge for us today. We celebrate today. We celebrate Easter and Jesus coming back and, and defeating death. But let's keep on celebrating. Because the tomb that's empty today, that tomb is going to be empty tomorrow. And it's going to be empty Wednesday. And it's going to be empty a month from now. It's going to be empty in June and July. And it's also going to be empty in November. The tomb is empty and it's going to stay that way. And the truth is this, is that the gospel lives on. And it's beautiful. And I hope that today, that Easter is not the only time that you remember and celebrate what God has done for you and me. Here's something that I've grown to love about Easter, but more in particular about God in this story. The incarnation takes place in the darkness of a womb. The resurrection takes place in the darkness of a tomb. And away from watching eyes, God performs his greatest acts. But then he gives us a first glance, a, a front row seat at what he is doing. And we get to see it, all that he has done in the midst of chaos. And maybe today, maybe today you need to move from one crowd to another. Maybe today you found yourself in, in one of these crowds. Maybe today you need to move from knowing him <clears throat> and knowing just about him to truly knowing him. Maybe, maybe you've heard for so long these stories of Jesus and you know about Jesus and you celebrate Jesus, but you don't really know him. Or maybe today you want to commit to move from just being here twice a year or, <laughs> or maybe even, you know, monthly. What if we're daring? What if we say, like, instead of going twice a year, Kyle, I want to commit to truly starting to know more about Jesus and I'll be there weekly. I know it's a big ask for some of us. But what if we decide today is a day that we want to change? What if today is a day that we move from just joining us a few times a year to weekly? 
And maybe, just, I don't know, maybe for some of us, you've been walking around with a false God in your mind. And you've been worshiping, worshiping something that is not him. And maybe today you want to know and you want to experience and have a relationship with the one true living God, Jesus. Jesus who died for you. Jesus who paid the price for you. So you yourself don't have to bear that cross and that weight. And maybe for those of us listening today, maybe that's you. Maybe this is the first time you've ever desired that. And maybe there's some of us listening and watching right now that maybe we need to rededicate ourselves today. We've walked and stranded away and and kind of wandered off the path with him. We've tucked him away when things got comfortable. But maybe today is a day that we need to say, God, I need to come back to you. We want to stand in your glory. And and if that's you, here's all it is. Here's all you got to do. Is just simply go to him and just say this prayer. Father, I know I've sinned. And I know I have sinned against you and hurt you. But God, I know that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. And I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to ask that you would come and take control over my life. I want to ask that you would remove me from the the position of, of driving my life. And rather, God, would you allow me just to be in the back seat and allow you to drive and control and move me in life. I pray that right now, God, that you would allow, allow me to just accept your forgiveness, Lord. Would you heal me? Would you just show me your love? And God, would you just give me your presence in a new way today, Lord? I praise in your name. Amen. And here's what's so beautiful is that maybe for you, you're sitting there and maybe, maybe you said that prayer for the first time today. Maybe for you, you rededicated your life. I'd love to follow up with you. I'd love if you sent me a message on, on Facebook here. I'd love if you sent me just a, a, maybe a comment. Maybe if you just sent me a personal message or email us through our website, whatever it might be. But would you just go and let us know? Would you let me know if that was you for the first time today? It tells us in the word that when somebody comes to know Jesus, there's a party unlike any other in the heavens. That the angels are roaring with praise because another child has come home to their dad who is standing with his arms wide open, welcoming them home because he has turned something that was destroyed and hurt and broken and he's made it new and uh, again and again. And the angels proclaim, Glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. Because his name is proclaimed and God is glorified. If that is you today, we want to celebrate. We want to worship God for what he's doing in your life. And I believe that God is doing something. I believe revival is coming. I believe his anointing is upon us. His presence is among us. And we get the opportunity to walk among it today. Because the truth is this. The good news for us today is this. The cradle, the manger is empty. The cross that he hung on is empty. And the tomb that he was laid in is empty. But the throne of eternity is occupied forever. He is here. He is good. He is God. Let's praise the name that he turns graves into gardens. Would you worship God?